Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Sarah from Teachers Happy and today I'm doing the very long awaited pre-service early career teacher Q&A. Oh, oh, oh. Now honestly, it has taken me a few goes to film this one because I just got really overwhelmed with the amount of questions. I did like screenshots upon screenshots upon screenshots of all your questions because swiping through them was just getting me really stressed out. So I just kind of tried to screenshot most of them and then I'm just gonna go into a screenshot, pick one off that page and that's the one I'll answer because otherwise this would be the longest video of all time. Okay, so the first question says, what things do you recommend to take on prac? Um, this is a really interesting one because prax looks so different across Australia, I'm sure across different countries as well, but even within different unis within Australia and different states, they're so different and the expectation might be really different for different prax. I know at my uni we did a first year prac where we just went and observed, a second year prac where we did a four week block on class. Our third year prac where we did another four week block and then our final internship which was 10 weeks on the same class which was amazing. Um, I think the expectation of each of those is a little bit different and what you should have prepared and ready would be different as well. I could probably make a whole video on this to be honest. Your uni should prepare you with what to take to an extent. I always take notebook, laptop. I don't pre-prepare resources until I've seen programs because generally your school will already have programs. They won't expect you to write them from nothing. If they do, that can be a little bit tricky, but hopefully they have like a scope and sequence or something you can go off. Don't expect to know the syllabus off by heart. It's just not possible, but obviously have that ready to go. I don't carry hard copies of stuff anymore. I load it all onto my iPad in PDFs or I just have it on my laptop ready that I can create a lesson alongside my teacher maybe to start, kind of see what they do and adapt. I think it's really important not to come in with all these like new behavior management, new reward systems or anything like that. I try to meld it around what's already in place kind of go with that and then slowly introduce. I don't think it's necessarily a good idea for a four week prac to introduce a whole new like reward system or prize box or something if the teacher doesn't already have that in place. The kids won't have enough time to be in routine and used to it. So making sure that you're not introducing too many things too quickly, that you're adapting to the style and then obviously bringing your own flavor as well. In regards to what to actually bring, I think laptop, notebooks, a planner of some form, somewhere to write down your reflections. Obviously you can all do that digitally. So just a laptop would be awesome and just be prepared for anything always pack your lunch so you have something to eat plenty of snacks because sometimes you have duty or you get taken off to this meeting or whatever it might be so there might not be specific times where you can go and get food lots of water to stay hydrated oh and a whistle is a really good thing to bring on prac as well because a whistle will save you in so many situations I think my biggest tip with prax or casual days or new experiences at a school is just to be as flexible and adaptable as possible. That's like a lot of, lots of bubbles. Anything that's thrown at you, just give it a go. You might not be the absolute best at it and no one's expecting you to be. It's just a matter of you just saying, hey, I'm gonna have a go at this and remembering to ask for guidance where you can and just kind of going with the flow. I know that lots of people get maybe anxious about those things or that they're gonna do the wrong thing. Sometimes nerves can be misconstrued as just hard to work with. So making sure that as much as you can, obviously be yourself, but just try and have a go and be just cruisy about the whole thing. If they ask you to take this class and spare the moment and you thought you were taking this other class, just go, yep and just figure it out as you go. To be super punctual so that you're ready to go and you give yourself as much time to be prepared as possible. Making sure that you have enough time to find out where you need to be, what you need to be doing and have everything prepared best as you can so you're not kind of rushing throughout the day. Not waiting in the photocopier line or trying to quickly source someone that's in a meeting that you need to speak to. I think it's super important to be as punctual as possible, especially if you're trying to gain a job or gain employment after this, whether it's a casual employment, whether you're on PRAC and you eventually want to be casual or whether you want to get a contract eventually, being punctual and being flexible will be your number one standout as a casual or to really make an impression is to show everyone your skills, um, not to just kind of stand back and be like, I don't know, like, I might not be the best at this. Just have a go, get in there, stage stuff, 
grade stuff, whatever it might be, any opportunity to get yourself in front of other teachers that can see how fabulous you are is really cool if you have any great skills, if you're an awesome sports person, music person, really arty, you've got some kind of specific skill that you know that you can bring to the table, try and show it off in some way. So we can see, hey, that could be a really valuable member of our team one day and you're more likely to be called for casual days being or for certain projects and things that might be on at school or committees and might be like hey I know a person that's really fantastic at that and you've proven yourself to be more valuable to the team okay this is a really interesting one how to talk to teachers in the staff room it sounds silly but can be very nerve-wracking I 100% agree and to be honest sometimes I still have nerves about going to the staff room especially if I go and visit like another school or anything like that you just don't know what to expect I guarantee 90% of the people that you work with are going to be absolutely fabulous and I'm sure you'll find someone to get along with and someone to talk to and like with any workplace you might have you know one or two people that might not be who you click with right away and that's okay. I think the important thing is to show kindness, flexibility and understanding to what other people might be going through just like you would with any other I don't know it's so weird to make like friendships as adults but any other workplace situation you would do exactly the same thing sitting down asking them about their day sometimes people can be a bit dismissive of other people's feelings or that maybe they have something really big going on that day as well so making sure you're not just making it all about you and that you are being understanding of the other person's time and of their situation as best as your knowledge allows you <laughs> I love this one about uni it says am I the only one who doesn't read all the readings every week will I fail as a teacher to be honest like I said in previous vlogs I was not the best uni student I just uh, I don't know I found uni very overwhelming and just trying to stay motivated and I always felt like I was behind and there was one or two people that would constantly have the answers in class about the readings every week they would underline and highlight and have all these sticky note tabs in their printed off readings and I'd be struggling to get it read it before the class. I don't think readings make the teacher. It is important to be organized and ready to go and maybe you need to set aside some time each week where you dedicate maybe an hour to doing a certain amount of readings a week. I don't know if you can possibly do them all. I certainly didn't. How do I make friends at uni? Making friends as an adult is really hard. I totally agree. The same kind of thing about what I talked about in the staff room. You can join like clubs and stuff but my uni didn't really have that or if they did they didn't really promote it enough for me to like join it. I actually found making friends at uni really really tricky. I started off my uni degree with a bunch of people from my high school and eventually they all kind of tapered off, changed degrees or got a job doing something else and I found myself very quickly alone and I was also working like three jobs at uni as well so I spent very little time at uni as possible just going into my lectures and into my shoots and stuff and I didn't coordinate my timetable with anyone so there was no specific person in my class that I saw every time so I made like lots of little friends at uni and but there wasn't someone that I got to sit with every day at lunch so I haven't exactly figured that out either but I think it's really important to strike up conversations with people around you and just ask I know it sounds so weird but we're all in this together and if they're going to be mean about it there's someone you probably didn't want to be friends with anyway but you can always just say like hey um do you want to go and get a coffee while we read over this stuff together or I'm totally confused can you help me with this thing it is really hard to make friends as an adult I agree I haven't figured that one out yet either this one's so interesting because I feel like a lot of people feel this way it says I'm scared I won't remember content to teach kids how do you remember what to do? A lot of the time, hopefully when you get into schools, they'll have programs ready to go or something for you to work off. You are not every time going, oh, I need to fill out this ogre lesson plan and get my paper syllabus and highlight and make sure that I cover all the things. Your school generally has like a scope and sequence or something for you to go off. You shouldn't be going in with nothing to support you and if you do you probably need to reach out to someone in your team or in your exec team and say hey what do I need to be covering within this time frame so that I know that I'm doing every fulfilling every requirement that I need but I just work off my program and then kind of merge it into my daily timetable trust me you won't forget it it's going to be fresh in your mind and if you do need a refresher I would just have the program ready for you whether that's on the computer or printed at your desk and you can always refer back to it our team last year did a lot of google slides just to help us out with our content as we moved into kind of digital units and then we just did made slides for everything because we went into online learning 
and now we have slides pretty much for our whole year and we don't always work on them but we know that if we were to go back to virtual learning at any point we could pretty much upload it the next day and it would be ready to go how do you teach when you've never taught Oh, I was so nervous for my first day of teaching, but luckily I'd actually taught at a music school before, which is not the same thing, but I felt like I'd been in front of a group of children and I had been out the front and I was the boss and it was really scary. So I felt a lot more comfortable than going into a classroom and doing the same thing. My biggest thing, which I've said in multiple videos is go in and volunteer at a school before your prac so that you're not going in completely with nothing and no experience. Volunteering might not mean that you get to be out the front of a classroom teaching but it might mean that you can take a small group and help out and watch somebody and observe and get clues and ideas from them like classroom management or how they deal with certain situations or the way they speak about something and then just apply that to yourself and to your own teaching when it's your turn to finally be out the front there is no easy way to do it other than just getting in there and having a go and I doubt you will fall on your face, but if you do, hopefully you have a supportive teacher with you to catch you and they should be able to jump in at any point. You should not be left completely alone on your first day of teaching unless you've finally finished uni and off to your, you know, big fancy job, but you should have done some kind of practical element before that happens anyway. And hopefully you can iron out the creases with the help of feedback from your mentor or your supervisor or whoever it might be. And remember to take on that feedback as well, because a lot of people maybe take it to heart. And I was someone that did the same thing, but applying that feedback will make you a better teacher. When should I start gathering my teacher resources? This is such a hot topic oh my goodness i feel like that's probably my most asked question in dms or comments is you know what should i get to be ready what should i get to be ready and i'm gonna say the same thing and it's probably not one, pe one people want to hear but that is nothing you should go into your school figure out what you need and then go from there i was somebody that only found out about getting a class four days before i started and i had already already like before i even thought i had a class accumulated all this stuff and a lot of it just sits in my room and doesn't get used so i kind of think that it's really good to get in there see kind of what's there and then you do you. If you want to buy the stuff, if you don't want to buy the stuff, it's up to you. But don't feel pressured to have it all together the first time. I'm in, about to start my fifth year of teaching and I don't have it together and I don't have every resource I'm ever going to need. You just kind of go with the flow and see how you go. What is appropriate to wear as a prac student? Anything I should avoid. This is a really tricky one because I know that if you work in different schools, they might have different guidelines. If you work in a government school, if you work in an independent or the Catholic system or whatever it might be, they might have their own policies around what to wear. I know that there's some schools that it is not okay to wear like sneakers every day or open toed shoes or whatever it might be. So I think it's really important on the first day or on a day that you might just visit the classroom just to kind of suss out and look around at other teachers and see kind of what the style of that school might be because I've been to schools that are like super casual and everyone's wearing like Converse and like flowy dresses and then I've been to schools where everyone's wearing like a collared shirt and work pants and sensible shoes. I'm not saying either is right or wrong I just think that you kind of got to fit into the school culture and whatever you feel comfortable wearing as well and if you're not sure you can always ask. I would say probably on your first day to avoid anything with spaghetti straps or anything like that making sure that you have a nice sleeve or um, an appropriate length outfit so that when you're bending down with kids that you are not going to be uncomfortable um, or showing off anything that might not be appropriate so I think pants are always a really good option like a nice flowy top sometimes and comfy shoes because your feet will hurt by the end of the day how to get your foot in the door early to secure a job once uni is over a lot of jobs that i've seen over the years be filled is by knowing people and i know that's a really tricky thing to say but if you're someone that's made an awesome impression at a prac or at a single casual day you're more likely to be called again so 
Um, it's pretty much just showing everything you can do during packs or on your casual days and showing that you are just easy to work with and that you're punctual. Sometimes it's enough to get you a lot of casual days. Showing that maybe you can make notes at the end of the day, leave the classroom nice for the teacher for the next day that it's not like a total tornado for them to walk back into and that you were able to tick off the majority of the list that they've left you. I've had some teachers where I've left them exact day plan and then they've gone completely off the plan for the whole day. I understand that not everything will be done. No one would expect you to have every single lesson done and perfect in the way they would have done it but trying to tick off the main important stuff and then if you've thrown in a random art lesson at the end because you only had a few minutes left that's okay too. How do you balance work and personal life? That is like my motto for this year. <laughs> no, that's a lie. My motto for this year was the year of health but I think that's got a lot to do with it. So balancing work and personal life and yeah, it's a lot. I haven't figured that one out yet. I think just taking time for self-care and prioritizing your own health is really, really important because you can't fill from an empty cup. I know that when I did my 10 week prac, I also worked like one or two days or like a Thursday night and a Saturday at my retail job just to stay afloat because I needed money. I would ideally, if I could go back in time, would have saved up a lot more money so I didn't have to work and work five days a week on prac at schools because it was just, I every week I was so exhausted losing my voice because I was working too much for my body to handle. So ideally if you're in a situation where you can save up some money and maybe just take a few less shifts or whatever it might be during your prac time, do that. But I understand there's lots of people in that situation where they're paying rent, they got kids and they can't take time off work to do uni stuff as well. So I guess whatever situation you're in, realize that you're probably going to need support in some way. So whether that's if you're still living with your parents, asking for you know some kind of support from them, whether it's just a cup of tea or emotional support by asking, hey mom, I need to talk to you about this thing. Your partner, knowing that you might need an extra help with your kids or you need to save up because you're gonna take four weeks off to do your prac. It just depends what situation you're in, but knowing that it's okay to need help and it's okay that you feel like you're drowning because everyone is, it's not just you. How to survive Len tight. Now I was, I think one of the first years that did the Lantai test and it's probably even different from when I did it. They had a bunch of papers on their website that I practiced doing and then I actually had to do a maths test I think even before that because I didn't do maths in 11 and 12 at school or year 12 at school. Yeah. So I did lots of past HSE papers and things around that time to pass that test, which I think really helped me for my land type test as well. But I would just go to their website and check out all the information on there because it's probably different from when I did it or even when someone did it two years ago. I think I only just passed as well. I don't think that I passed with flying colors. It was a really cheeky test, but it is possible to do it. And if you don't pass the first time, you can do it multiple times. Common misconceptions of a prac teacher. It's a nervous time. I think me as a crack teacher I went in thinking I have to be the best I have to look like I have years of experience and I think that's just so unrealistic your teacher's gonna know that you are fresh you do not have years of experience behind you in teaching so I think it's important to kind of take that pressure off yourself and know you can just do the best that you can with the knowledge that you have because you can't be a superhero and just know everything and be fantastic the first time around and only get good feedback it's just not a thing you might be very natural at it and get awesome some feedback but you are not going to be perfect I'm still I like no this is my fifth year and I've only been teaching a little while but I still make mistakes all the time don't put so much pressure on yourself to be the best most experienced teacher in the room because the odds are you are not going to be I'm sure you're going to be fabulous and do the absolute best you can with the knowledge you have and actually take on what your prac teacher your practice supervisor is saying to you because that will then make you grow and be even better. The most frustrating thing as a practice supervisor, and I've been one twice now, luckily to the most fantastic people ever, but I've overseen some other ones, and when they haven't taken on feedback, I know how frustrating it can be for the supervisor as well who is trying to help. Alternatively, story time. There was one of my friends who had a supervisor that she felt as in uh, that she clashed heads with a lot and it was really tricky. I hope that that never happens to you. And if it does, remember you can always reach out to your uni or to maybe the like prac coordinator at your school and just say hey I'm really struggling with this I feel like this is happening because sometimes things happen that are out of your control I don't know it's such a tricky one just don't feel alone in that 
and make sure that you reach out if you're feeling like you're just clashing so much that it's actually not an enjoyable experience for either of you because maybe you are not a good pairing. What a mentor wants to see, expects from the first meeting, how to prepare best for your prac. I think that just being punctual and quick with your emailing back and forth, um, I know initially the way that I've done it, I don't know if every uni does it, is I get an email from my prac student saying, hey, my name is so-and-so, I'm going to be on your class for this period of time and giving me exact dates because I know sometimes unis don't, you don't always like line up if you don't go to uni five days a week and things like that. So making sure you've got, hey, your full name, when you're going to be joining for prep, any questions that you might have first off and asking if you need to have anything prepared for that teacher. And then your teacher would hopefully write back to you and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, so excited to have you. Here is our Google Drive, or here is a copy of our programs. I would love you to have this, this, and this prepared for the first day. Or sometimes your teachers might just say, hey, I wanna meet you up front and we'll sit down and do it together. Or they might say, well, on the first day, just come and observe, and then we'll go from there. So it just kind of depends on your supervisor and what they expect. But as the prac student, I think it's really important to be on top of what your uni requires you to do because your supervisor might not be as aware of it as you are because we only get some like random sheets that say what you're required to do. I think it's more important that you know what you're required to do and then we just oversee it. Organization tips for placement and how to keep on top of everything. This is so tricky because I feel like so many people on placements just plan for the night before for the next day. I would try and aim to sit down with your prac supervisor and get maybe five days or three to five days worth of what you need to do and make a big to-do list and try and smash it out maybe a little bit on the weekend and that way each night you're not working an eight hour day plus and then doing six hours of planning that night for the next day. I think it would be awesome to maybe sit down on the Friday um, and plan out your whole next week that you at least can smash out Monday, Tuesday on the weekend and then only have to do a little bit of planning for the rest of the week in your nights because otherwise you will be so tired go to bed early don't stay up all night planning and then be so wiped for the next day it's just not going to be a good time for anybody if i choke at the interview will this reduce my chance of receiving a contract i hope that you do not choke i'm sure you'll be fantastic do you know what my interview was so awkward i wore a collared shirt a blazer like so, like a really cute tie kind of, i don't know how to explain it um, like a bow tie kind of thing, work like work pants, like thick work pants and clunky shoes. And I felt like I looked so professional and the whole time I was so thankful I wore the blazer because my back was wet because I was so nervous. I was sweating so much in that interview and I thought that I was giving a very bad interview. Um, but the person was so lovely and it was kind of just more like a general conversation. They're not there to interrogate you and try and poke holes in your credibility as a teacher. Their job is just to suss out whether you are a capable human, which I'm sure you are if you've got three or four years of uni and that you might have special interests in certain areas or you might be interested in going out and teaching rural or if you're more interested in teaching in your area, if you're interested in being a casual teacher or you want a permanent job. If Look, I'm hoping this is still the same thing for interviews because I haven't looked into it recently. But what I had to do was have like a little teaching portfolio with my philosophy. I forget what the other documents are. I might write them below or do like another thing on my Instagram about that. And I had memorized the stage statement for a particular stage. I think I picked stage like one or early stage one because it was the easiest to memorize. I can't remember now. And yeah, they just kind of ask you some questions about that. Again, it is not a, like a police interrogation. It's just to check out that you are a capable human ready to teach and that you went to uni for four years. I was very blessed to get a permanent position, not necessarily like straight away. I did get it for the following year, but a permanent position as a targeted graduate. So many people ask me how I did it. And to be honest, I don't even know how I did it. There was no, you got it because of this. I think it was just a mix of trying to be amazing at my prax and getting really good feedback and applying it so that my supervisor report at the end of my prax were awesome. During my interview, I was just very upfront about where I wanted to work, that I was willing to work a bit further away from home, but I wasn't willing to go out rural just yet, but keeping open and honest about what you actually want and what your skills and talents were. I said that I was a dance teacher, music teacher, and that is where my passion is. So I think I was put down as 
you know, someone that was able to do that. And I think that just kind of all contributed to my graduate teaching position. But to be honest, I actually have no idea how I got it. And I'm so lucky and I wish I knew to tell people, but there's no email that says you got it because of this reason. You just get an email to say you're either on like a waiting list and you can apply for these certain jobs or you've got a job. I feel like so many of these are just about getting up confidence. And I think that's something that you just have to build over time. I don't think there's any way to be like, I'm just going to be super confident today. But I really agree with the statement. If you just act confident, people think that you are. So even if on the inside, you're totally freaking out and you're getting a neck rash, which is what I get when I'm getting nervous. If you just act like you know what you're doing, you're pretty much doing what everyone else is doing. They're all just acting like they know what they're doing. No one actually knows what they're doing. Ever. Do you make your own worksheets or content or do you use sources such as like Twinkle and like Teach Data and Teach This and all those kind of things? I definitely used to, especially when I was in uni because I didn't even know they were a thing. Now that I know, I'm kind of like, go check them out um, to my prac students because they, I think it's important that you don't reinvent the wheel. However, some of those things on websites like that might not be completely aligned with the lesson you're doing and just printing out a worksheet does not a lesson make. Make sure that lessons are as open-ended and hands-on as physically possible and then maybe do your worksheets and things right at the end to consolidate or just use them as like a mini assessment or something. It is really tricky because a lot of people go, oh, but that just completes everything that I need to know. But I'm like, you have to explicitly teach that content. By giving them that worksheet, they have learned nothing. They're just showing you what they've learned. But if you haven't done the explicit part properly or you haven't done an activity or something to go with it, they're just telling you what they already know onto that worksheet, if that makes sense. But yes, definitely utilize those resources, especially the hands-on things. If they've got like cool like flashcards and dominoes and roll and do activities and bingos and things like that, I think they're super beneficial. Just make sure they're super aligned to your lesson that you're not just trying to tick a box because it was the first thing that came up when you looked up whole number. Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't create your own worksheets if there is one out there for you ready to go. Okay, what to include in your program folder. I think it's really important to not put in every single activity and resource at the front. The things that I found the most important within my folder that my supervisor wanted to see were my reflections, my program and how I'd registered it and evaluations of my lessons. Like those kind of things are way more important to show that you're a reflective learner yourself about what you're doing, the feedback that you have taken on and how you've reapplied it. I wouldn't get so worried with putting in like every activity and worksheet within your folder. I think the reflective part is way more important and probably what your supervisor is more interested in seeing. But you can always just ask them and what they would like you to have in it. And generally your uni should have a list or something about what is required of you to have within your program folder because sometimes your supervisor will have no idea and will ask you. Oh, this is so tricky. Tips on being liked but respected by the kids. If someone has the magic fairy dust that can work this out, let me know. It is such a tricky thing. Remember, you are not there to be their peer. You are there as their teacher, whether you're a prac teacher, whether you're an early career teacher, whether you're a teacher that's been teaching for 10 years, 20 years, you're not there to be their peer. You are there to teach them. And yes, there is a an element of friendship weaved in there and being liked weaved in there, but that is built over time and that is built by relationship. So you taking time to get to know your kids and things that they like and dislike will be a world of good. I always take time, especially with my prac student, to get them to come in a day even before their prac and just spend like an hour or two getting to know the kids, getting to know their names, what they like, what they dislike, how they learn. I think building relationships and rapport is the only way to do that. However, if you're not liked by a kid, that is okay. You are <laughs> you're the big boss in the classroom. You're the teacher. You need them to be learning and just keep building those relationships as best as you can. You are not there to be their bestie. You are there to be their teacher, their educator, and the relationships, yes, should come first, but you are there to educate them, not to be their peer. What's the best way to introduce yourself to the class, this one is so tricky because I feel like some teachers don't like to say that this is like a prac teacher or someone that's still learning to be a teacher. But I think that's really important for the kids to know because you're going to make mistakes at some point or you're not going to do something the same way as the teacher that's in there. And I think it's important to be transparent with the kids and not be like, oh, yeah, this is a teacher that's been teaching 10 years and she's just coming to hang out for free with our class for four weeks. 
I think they will see right through that. So I think it's important to explain it to them, why you're there, what you're learning to do and how, um, what you want to get out of that experience with them. And just knowing that you're just like an extra person to be there for them. Um, and it's really exciting for you and your enthusiasm will hopefully transfer to them and they'll be enthusiastic back. How to find a good behavior management strategy on prac without disrupting the class. I think this is similar to what I said before, which is do not reinvent the wheel. If your teacher already has something in place, try to use that. Um, especially if it's only like a two, three, four week prac, don't come in with a brand new thing because the kids need time to like get in routine and for it for it to be effective. Kind of come in with your own style and things like that so you can add that flavor in, but I wouldn't come in with like a brand new strategy and try and teach it because it probably will take them the four weeks to even learn how it is used and then you're gone. So just try, try and meld as much as you can without losing your own style. Yeah, that's so tricky, especially if you don't necessarily agree with the behavior management technique, but I'm assuming it would be like a whole school or whole stage thing. It wouldn't just be complete individual teacher. I don't know, that one's a really tricky one. How many hours after school did you prep for the next day? Now this is very different now than what it was in my first year of uni, second year of uni, third year. Um, and then all the way up to where I am now. Um, I used to spend a lot more time preparing then than I do now. I've been on year two, this is my second year on year two, so I've kind of already done this year before. I know what to expect, so I don't spend as much time planning. I think I'm just more refining and evaluating the lessons that I've previously done, reflecting on them and changing them so that they're even better. So I spent a lot less time and I couldn't give you a number amount because it's so different at different times of the year. But I think that you cannot lose sleep over it because you still need a good night's sleep. So don't work anywhere into your sleeping time. That's not okay because you need to be refreshed and ready to go for the next day. I can't give you a number amount. I'm sorry. I know you want me to just say, oh, just do like one to two hours. I don't know. It's different for everyone's different situation. What was the hardest part of your journey training to become a teacher. Honestly, I think uni was the hardest part. Yeah, man, that was tricky. I just... I didn't get it. I didn't, uni didn't click for me. I just w found it really hard to stay motivated. Like I said, I was working like three jobs and going to full-time uni and I didn't really have any friends and it was just like not an amazing time for me. I also think that my whole heart wasn't in it until I did my first prac and went, this is what I want to do purely motivated by the fact that I had pracs coming up and I knew that I loved them. So all the readings and the learning and the tricky stuff that was in essays and assignments and things going wrong and losing assignments because I didn't back them up. It was just kind of all the in-between part because I knew my end goal was that I wanted to teach and that I knew from my pracs that that's what I wanted to do. I know some people aren't so sure and that makes it really tricky. So I'm not really sure what to do about that. But I know that if you know your end goal and you're enjoying your pracs so much or you're volunteering and you're seeing what a classroom's like and you know that that's what you want to do and you want to be up the front there, then that's got to be your motivator to keep going because it's very hard to find motivation in any other way. Did you ever have any bad supervising teachers when you were on Prac. No, I was so lucky. I only ever had like really good ones, but I did have friends that had maybe not so great ones or ones they didn't get along with really well. The only experience I had that was probably more tricky than they weren't bad by any means was that I was on a class where someone went on the prac teacher went on maternity leave like halfway through um, and they were on a job share with the I think like deputy not deputy principal, an assistant principal who was also off class a lot. So it was just kind of me and a casual teacher almost every day. And it was just really, really tricky because I felt like I wasn't getting like consistent feedback or support. So that was really, really tricky. So I think kind of that's more up to the supervisor to know, hey, I'm not actually going to be on class that much. It might not be the time for me to take on a prac student. And it's kind of like the draw. And I know that's really, really hard to hear sometimes, but just do the best with what you're given. And I'm sure that you will be a superstar. At the start of your course, did you feel overwhelmed and worried you would forget important 
info yes oh my gosh i think i cried like every week in the start of my uni degree for like the first year and bryce would always be like just remember your end goal remember your end goal and i was like i just don't want to do it anymore i want to drop out heaps of people i know had dropped out by this point or gone and done like another degree or something and i just couldn't see the end goal because i hadn't done my prax yet and i think that's why i always say like volunteer get in schools because that's the thing that's going to inspire you to keep going essays are not going to inspire you to keep going the kids are so i think it's really important to try and find that motivator for yourself whether it's knowing that you have a uni degree or knowing that you get to teach in a classroom that feeling of accomplishment is amazing but it is a hard road to get there uni is not easy i'm not going to say that it is but i think as much as you can ask for help and not be afraid to say like, hey, hey, I need help. I need support in this. And I'm sure that if you can have some people around you to help you through that time, that would be amazing. People that have kids or really hard circumstances, my absolute, like, good on you because I know how hard it was. I had somewhere to live. I wasn't paying rent. Um, so I, and I didn't have like other people to look after. So amazing. If you're doing that, just hats off to you. And even if you're in my situation and you, you know, have a loving family to look after you too, it is still really hard. Just keep going because you're a superstar and you've got this and one day you get to be a teacher, which is the best job. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you give it a thumbs up if you would like to see a part two or comment below any other questions that you might have. And I will try to get around to answering them all. If you haven't checked me out on Instagram, or you haven't subscribed to this channel make sure you do because there is so much content for teaching lifestyle craft i really appreciate you tuning into this one and for watching thank you kindly oh, oh, oh.